You think your life is hard? Sperm has it so much harder than you. Hey everybody, Organized Biology here. Today we're talking the male reproductive trap, or we're switching it up. We're talking about the dangerous, treacherous journey the sperm has to take in order to fertilize that egg way the heck up there. So what we're going to do is we're going to talk about all the obstacles that the sperm has to overcome in the female reproductive tract in order to even get to the egg. And on the way, we're going to talk about the structures in the male reproductive tract that help the sperm actually overcome those barriers. So once we produce that sperm, how does it get help to actually achieve its shining goal to fertilize the egg and make you? or another human being for that matter. Because we were all once there. We were all once sperm that won this amazing race. So let's get started. So first, the female reproductive tract. One egg is usually ovulated at a time, and it'll be ovulated way the heck up here. And it's basically saying, come on sperm, good luck, try to get to me. Because here's what's happening. Within this female reproductive tract, let me label these structures real fast. So the sperm has to get through the vagina, cervix, uterus, and then swim up through the fallopian tubes to finally get to that oocyte, which is the egg cell. Now along the way, it's going to encounter a vast variety of dangerous obstacles, the first of which being a long, long distance. You see, if you were to actually measure the tract of the female reproductive system, it's going to be about 25 centimeters long. But if you take your sperm that's over here, the sperm's length is only about 0.05 millimeters long. If you do the math, that is about 60,000 times the length of the sperm cell. So that's the equivalent of you and I literally moving approximately 60 miles. <laughs> and furthermore, not only does the sperm have to travel that whole distance, but it also has no food source or energy source whatsoever. You see, normally all your cells have an energy source, right? It's coming from the blood, you're eating food, right? You're breathing in oxygen, but now you're transporting this sperm into this no man's land and just saying, good luck, try to swim up there. So those are already bad enough, but then we've got several others. You see, along this entire track, there's going to be pathogens. And the reason pathogens like to grow here is because it's a relatively acidic environment. And I don't know about you, if I was a sperm, I would not like to be bathed in acid nor pathogens because these are like your bacteria and stuff like that, and they'll actually kill that sperm. So we've got to overcome that as well. But wait, there's more. See, once the sperm get to, say, right here, do you see a problem? Well, there's two different directions we could go, and only one has the egg. Uh, so once the sperm get here, they actually have to decide which way to go. Now, fun fact, the egg does help with that, it'll make some chemicals to basically draw the sperm towards itself, but the sperm basically have to choose the right direction. A path diverged in the forest and hopefully the sperm took the right one, okay? Now, last one. If the sperm, amazingly, gets to this point where it's all the way nearing that egg cell, it will have to fight back against waves of cilia. You see, up here in the fallopian tube in the female reproductive tract, cilia are basically these long extensions of cells, and they're actually going to beat, so move their arms that direction. Now, the reason they're doing this is if the egg gets fertilized, we need to bring the egg to the uterus to get implanted, but the sperm are actually swimming upstream. They're like salmon. And in a way, these cilia are quite evil. There's actually been studies where the cilia will literally trap sperm underneath them for several days at a time basically looking for the strongest survivor, which is fascinating that all of us won that race at one point. We were probably stuck in a cilia hair at one point and wiggled our way out and made it to the oocyte. So well done, you and me. Fist bump. All right, so let's jot those things down too. Okay, so now that we know all the obstacles we're going to hit on our way to the oocyte, let's actually talk about how we produce the sperm and how the sperm overcomes those barriers. So first off, this all starts at puberty. Doesn't all hell break loose then anyway? And what happens is your hypothalamus, which is one of the base parts of your brain, will have some neurons that are sitting on the more anterior side. And these neurons are just signaling cells, and in this case, they're actually going to signal and release what's called hormones into the bloodstream of the anterior pituitary gland. These hormones are called gonadotropin-releasing hormones. Now, before I move forward with this, go ahead. If you don't know these hormones, please jump over to the endocrine system overview video. This will explain it in a little more detail. But what these guys do, and once again, they are released at puberty, is they're going to travel down to the anterior pituitary where there are going to be other cells. And these other cells basically get that signal, that hormone, take it up, and they're like, whoa, okay, we need to start producing some reproductive hormones because it's in the name, right? Gonads, right, basically means reproductive. 
Tropin means to act upon these cells, and it's going to release those hormones. Okay, awesome. So what do these guys produce? They will produce two hormones, one called follicle-stimulating hormone and one called luteinizing hormone. Now, once these guys are produced, they are actually going to stimulate sex cell production. And in this case, it's going to be our sperm cell. Now, the way we actually produce sperm is quite complex. So these hormones are going to travel down to the sperm-producing organ called the testes. And they are going to start stimulating spermatogenesis, which is basically the production of sperm. So if I were to take a cross-section of the testes here, and I'm going to look inside of them in what's called the seminiferous tubules, this is what I would see. I would first see these relatively normal looking cells, and these are actually called spermatogonia. Now this literally means baby sperm, and they don't look capable, right, of actually moving up to that area. They're just little round balls, they're not going to do a whole lot. So we need to differentiate them into actual mature sperm. So how do we do that? Those hormones. So what's going to happen is the luteinizing hormone is going to come in, it's going to talk to cells that are sitting outside of the seminiferous tubules. And these cells are called Leydig cells, otherwise known as interstitial cells. They're the same thing. And what the Leydig cells are doing is very, very important. They begin producing the male hormone, which is called, you got it, testosterone. Now, the testosterone is the hormone that deepens your voice, that gives you the secondary sex characteristics of a male, so like hair on your chin and all the other places. But the main goal of testosterone is actually to basically go in here and talk to these spermatogonia and say, yo, Start producing sperm. You are now sexually mature, so let's start producing the sperm. So as they begin differentiating based on the testosterone, they're going to be helped out by other cells that are chilling in between them. And these guys are called Sertoli cells, literally translating to the nurse cells. So these are the cells that are going to help guide the sperm into differentiation into the mature sperm. Now, how do we get these guys to start working? Well, follicle stimulating hormone. They're actually going to talk to the Sertoli cells and talk to them and be like, yo, start helping these sperm out to actually differentiate. So it's kind of like a two-pronged approach, right? We've got both the Leydig cells and the Sertoli cells helping guide the sperm into differentiation. And they will begin dividing, dividing, dividing the sperm cells. And they are going to turn into mature sperm that will look like that. Now, the process by which we go from spermatogonia to actual sperm cells is called the process of meiosis. If you don't know about meiosis, please hop over to this video here where I explain it in a really quick, brief overview. So once we produce our sperm, they will look like this. Now, think about this. Why would we want them to look like this rather than like this based on the obstacles? Well, you can see that on the base, we've got this long projection called a flagella. And you know that the flagella is like a flag, right? It's going to whip like crazy so that the sperm can actually move. And that's going to help with this long distance. So since we have the sperm's tail, now we're going to be able to swim for a long period of time. But that takes a lot of, you guessed it, energy, OK? So in the sperm itself, we're going to have this little part called the midpiece. And the midpiece is going to be jam-packed with a bunch of organelles. Can you guess which organelle I'm going to mention here? Well, we're talking about energy, right? So this is going to be jam-packed with your favorite organelle, the mitochondria, which is the, if you didn't say powerhouse of the cell, you don't deserve to be watching this video. But while you are here, go ahead and click that subscribe button and the like button because it's a nice thing to do. And it's helpful for me to make more videos like this. So now that we have our mitochondria, well, we know that the mitochondria makes ATP, right? Which is the energy currency for the cell. But if you've watched my ATP video, you know that we can only make ATP if we have a fuel source like a sugar and oxygen, right? Well, we don't have any sugars available for this, okay? So that's kind of a problem, and we're gonna fix that a little later. So we need some, we need some fuel to go with this mitochondria. Now, the last thing here I'm going to point out is going to be the acrosome. Now, the acrosome contains this dark center right here, and that's gonna be the nucleus of the sperm. And the nucleus, after meiosis, like I mentioned previously, is going to have half the number of chromosomes as normal. And that's important because when it joins with the oocyte, it'll also have half the number of chromosomes. Take those halves together, and now you have a full functioning human with a full set of chromosomes. So we got our nucleus here that we need to get into the egg. The acrosome will also contain some digestive enzymes here that will help basically break down the oocyte barriers, but we won't talk about that today. Okay, great. So now we've got the long distance, but we don't have an energy source. We don't have a way to fix the pathogens of acidity. We don't know which way to go, and ah, this is silly. Okay, so let's talk about how we can kind of overcome these. And for that, we need to actually hop into the male reproductive tract itself. Starting with the sperm production in the testes, which I'll label here, 
you notice how the testes are kind of hanging outside of the body a little bit. Now, now, why is that? They seem a little, you know, subject to damage when they're hanging out like that. Well, there's a reason for that. The testes optimally make sperm at about 95 degrees Fahrenheit. So what's your body temperature? About 98 degrees Fahrenheit, and that's right up in here is 98. So we need to hang them out a little bit outside of the body to optimize sperm production. And in fact, you can make literally millions to billions of sperm every day. So it's a very, very efficient process. Now, once the sperm are produced, as we showed there, they're going to be stored in this little part called the epididymis. Epididymis literally means upon the twins because it is upon the twin testicles. Great name, right? So anyway, the epididymis will store that mature sperm, and when ejaculation occurs, we're actually going to send it up this big, long, winding tube that's very vast. And the way I remember that is because it's the vas deferens. Now this is the site of a vasectomy, and the vasectomy is a type of birth control because we basically snip this out and we don't allow the sperm to actually leave. Okay? Now, as the sperm goes up and around, why do you, it, it seems so inefficient. Don't we just need to get them out, right, out through the penis? But instead, we're sending them back posteriorly through all these different things. So let's point these guys out next. This guy right here is called the seminal vesicle. And if you think of like your seminal work, right, it's like your crowning achievement, it's because this vesicle, this little uh, storage area of fluid, has a lot of important things within it. Three things I'm going to mention here. Number one being fructose and citric acid. Your alarm bells should be going off and be like, wait, 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 fructose, that's a sugar, right? And sugar helps make energy. So this fructose is going to help the mitochondria actually produce ATP for that flagella to whip so that the sperm can swim. So that's awesome. So we've got an energy source now. And citric acid does the same exact thing, goes into the citric acid cycle, which is basically right before the electron transport chain, which is right before making ATP. If you want to learn more about that, I've got a sequence of videos somewhere on my channel. It might be right here. So we've got these fuel sources. Awesome. But next up, we're also going to make what's called fibrinogen. And this is an inactive clotting protein. More on that in a second. But then lastly, the last thing that the seminal vesicle will make are prostaglandins. Ooh, this one's cool. So prostaglandins, if you learn about them, they contract smooth muscle, basically involuntary muscle in a variety of different body parts, specifically lining the uterus. So there will be smooth muscles lining this uterus, and if the prostaglandins come into contact with them, what will happen is the muscles will contract, and they will push that direction. So these muscles are contracting like this. Why do you think that's happening? Well, it's so that any sperm that are maybe down here could get pulled up very rapidly by the smooth muscle contraction. So it helps again with that long distance. Wonderful. So moving on. So after we pass through the seminal vesicle, we're going to go through another structure called the prostate gland. Okay, and there's a reason I'm writing prostate gland right next to the rectum, which is right here, basically where poop is stored, is because if you get a prostate examination as a man, some of you are cringing already, you get a finger, a gloved finger, up the butt, up the anus, and they actually push it right about here and ask you to cough. Because if you cough, the prostate might push on you, and if it's too swollen, you'll really feel a big bulge. So it's basically a test to see if you have an enlarged prostate. Well, why do we have it in the first place? Well, the prostate gland is going to produce alkaline fluid. Ding, ding, ding. You should already be noticing, well, alkaline is the opposite of acidic, and it'll help neutralize acid in the vaginal canal and the uterus and everywhere else. But if you think about it, it's also going to pass through a region where urine has come through, because this is the bladder. And urine has passed through here before in that same tube, right, called the urethra. So we also need to neutralize the acid of the potential urine that's chilling out there too. So the prostate gland makes that alkaline fluid, basically helps the sperm survive the journey out as well as survive the journey in. Awesome. And the next thing that the prostate will make is things called clotting factors and fibrinolytics. Okay, what's going on here? Well, the clotting factors is going to help activate the fibrinogen that came from the seminal vesicle right before it, right? So that'll help basically clot the sperm up, and then after the sperm has been deposited in the female reproductive tract, the fibrinolytics, which literally means fibrin breaking, will release that clot of sperm and allow them to freely swim. Now, why do you think that's important to clot the sperm up during ejaculation and actually once they get into the vaginal canal? Well, probably to prevent damage to the sperm as well as, I use this analogy in class, I hope it helps you. If you've ever heard about the Revolutionary War when like the Redcoats, the British were fighting, they would fight in these big lines, basically columns of men in red coats. And so where would you not want to be if you were marching in that line? 
Well, you wouldn't want to be along the outside. You want to be kind of near the inside. And think about it. If the sperm are clotted together, there's going to be sperm on the outside, on the periphery. And as they travel through, some of the peripheral sperm might get killed off by the pathogens, but that'll keep the interior alive. That'll keep the sperm inside alive as they're trying to overcome this long distance. So it's kind of like a band of brothers helping each other out, hoping to get to the end, the glory end of the oocyte. anyway. Now there's one more gland just to mention, the bulbourethra gland. And it has very similar secretions than the prostate, so I'm not going to really mention it here. So as the sperm are traveling out, once again, they're traveling through this urethra on its way out, and I'm still hung up on this long distance. That's still a long distance, so we need to help the sperm out as best we can. So that is why we have a penis. Now, the penis is a little longer so that when the sperm actually travels out, it's already going to have a little distance that it's traveled, right? That's the reason insertion occurs in the first place. But in order to do that properly, we have to have what's called erection. So what erection is, is when blood will actually engorge these regions here, as well as some regions a little more internally. These structures are called the corpus cavernosum and the corpus spongiosum. So during sexual activity, these will be engorged with blood and actually erect the penis so that insertion can happen to get the sperm as far in as possible before they start swimming. Great. All right, just as a summary, we've got these guys figured out, the long distance, the energy source, the pathogens, and acidity, but the which way and the cilia ug, right? Well, at this point, we've got many, many sperm that have probably reached up until this region. So when the egg is ovulated, there may be thousands of sperm already there, okay? But that was of the potentially 2 billion sperm released during ejaculation in the first place. So why do we still have things that the sperm have to overcome? Well, this could be an evolutionary adaptation of the cilia trying to hold on to the strongest sperm so that only the ones that can survive the longest will survive. And if you're planning to become pregnant, or avoid pregnancy for that matter, I recommend you watch the female reproductive system as we're going to talk a little more about when the egg is ovulated and how we can know.